be here, and uh, looks like a completely packed audience. So we'll get right to the point, <laughs> and uh, we I will. I was actually told that because you're going to get drilled, so we'll put you on a more comfortable seat. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So you, and as long as you don't doze off while I'm asking the questions. <laughs> so um, we'll we'll just start off uh, right away, um, Rohit. First and foremost. How does it feel to be a rock star internet entrepreneur in these times? <laughs> I don't know much about the rock star part, but you know, first of all, I want to thank Serge, uh, the conference, for giving me one more reason to be in Bangalore. It's, you know, I don't know how many people know, but before we started Snapdeal, we, I actually used to work out of Bangalore, and I still miss the weather. That's half the reason why we had to set up our technology center here, more than, also more than the fact that, you know, there's so many technology people here. It's a, Absolutely fantastic city. Uh, about specifically your question, I actually, you know, uh, we are as people very passionate about the mission that we are on, uh, and what really excites us to this day, and we are very hands-on with our business, is just you know, uh, continuously driving towards our mission. What are we building for consumers? What technology are we using? How are we making our products better? How are we making the user experience better? Etc. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera, et cetera. And everything else to us is an outcome. Some of these things are good to feel about, some, some you actually feel awkward about. I actually, you know, really, I was telling Saurabh before, uh, before our meeting that actually I want to actually see all the stalls outside, but by removing my name tag, because so that people don't start pitching the moment I'm out there. So, I'm, so there's, there's a good part to it, uh, but there's, a, there's also a part which, you know, at least shy people like me shun away from. But you've not reached the stage <laughs> where people come up to you at restaurants and disturb your meal. No, thankfully not. <laughs> okay, good. And I'm, I'm happy the way it is. So there's a lot of talk now about the uh, internet uh, economy and all of that. Mm -hmm. And this is the place to where it's all happening. Much of it is happening. Um, tell us uh, of late how you have been building the e-commerce platform and the ecosystem around Snapdeal. Mm -hmm. Because even in Forbes India recently, we've covered a great deal of it. Every day, you're, you know, some bits of it uh, is being reported. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to hear from you how this ecosystem thinking came about mm -hmm. and how you are taking it forward. Sure. So uh, <clears throat> actually, it's uh, very interesting. Many people, when they think about e-commerce or technology or any other business, you know, many times human brain is conditioned to uh, think of things in silos, that hey, there is this product e-commerce company which should be like the 10 other product e-commerce companies that have existed in the world. Or there is this payments company which again should be like the 10 other payments companies that have existed in the world. But the real world doesn't work like that. Uh, especially if you think about India. One of the things which is very different and that's only happening in India as compared to any other market uh, in the world where e-commerce, internet took off, is that the smartphone is a primary device for us. Uh, and you know, actually one of my uh, fellow entrepreneurs was describing to, me, describing to me what is the difference between using a PC for internet versus using a smartphone for internet. Mm -hmm. So, which I found very relevant, is that when we used to, I don't know how many people here have accessed internet ever on a laptop or a PC. How many people haven't accessed on a laptop or a PC? I'm surprised. Okay. I'm assuming everyone is okay. at some part of their life. I think people are, it's still early in the morning, so people are probably not raising their <laughs> hands. But I'm assuming most people have accessed internet on a laptop. When you access internet on a laptop, you spend five minutes, uh, you know, so you spend one hour, two hours continuously doing something uh, very specific. And I would, uh, and when you go to the smartphone, you're always checking internet every 10 minutes. You know, so then uh, the, the good way to think about is that uh, what uh, PC internet is the equivalent of having a lunch, mm -hmm. a really big lunch at mm -hmm. one time, mm -hmm. whereas mobile internet is like S having two biscuits yeah. every 10 minutes. Snacking. Yeah, it's, mm -hmm. You're snacking on mm -hmm. internet every 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. But as a result, consumer behavior is changing very drastically. Mm -hmm. uh, is that people are accessing the internet many more times a day, very 10, true. 20, 30, 40, 50 times a day. And as a result, they're also doing many more things on the internet mm -hmm. uh, as compared to what they were doing on the PC. Right. And also, they want to get those things done really, really fast. Mm. Uh, again, no one has the patience now as they used to have in PC that, hey, let me sit on my PC, spend 30 minutes, or spend one hour, uh, one right. hour and do something. On the mobile, you know, people, if they want to check their WhatsApp, they want to check it in five seconds and be out. Mm. If they want to check the latest photos of their friends, 
they check uh, Facebook for 10 seconds and they're out. Yeah. So people want to do things really fast. Mm -hmm. And that's that means that when people are accessing internet so frequently, uh, successful commerce companies will get built by participating in more and more of such internet yeah. interactions, which means having only one type of things will not do it for you. Right. Uh, if you're selling only products, all of us don't buy products every day, mm. but we do something on the internet. Mm. We spend money somewhere, be it taking a cab, be it you know, buying a product, mm. booking a flight ticket, paying for food, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that made us feel that the, the success, most successful commerce companies in India uh, will get built by building an ecosystem which participates in people's daily lives mm. and tries and interact, uh, makes life easier for users when they're doing commerce transactions in more and more, more cases, which is why we are focusing on building a commerce ecosystem which has uh, our B2C business, which is Snapdeal, our payments business, which is free charge, our C2C business, which is Shopo, and we'll keep expanding the portfolio of so, things so we have to uh, It's interesting you say that, Rohit. You've come to this stage of evolution of Snapdeal. Mm -hmm. Now, what, maybe six times you've changed your business model from that couponing company, which, yeah. you know, then it went online and the rest of it, as they say, is history. Mm -hmm. So tell me, how do you keep, uh, you know, it's not easy that now a company of your size mm -hmm. is constantly reinventing itself. How mm -hmm. does one uh, keep thinking ahead in terms of, uh, is it the way you guys are wired or how does it work? So very good question. I remember the, I think the, the first time we changed our business model, I, th I don't think the word pivoting had become popular mm -hmm. by then. Mm -hmm. So the first time we changed our business model, people were very surprised. Why are you changing something? Mm -hmm. uh, over a period of time, once we did two, three times, then I think the word pivoting became a little more popular. So mm -hmm. then you know, we had a phrase for what we were doing as a company. Mm -hmm. But two, three things that you know, uh, we've also learned as entrepreneurs as we've grown up our, in our evolution journey. Num thing number one is you know, just we are, as a company and as people, relentlessly focused on making the most successful company that we ever can. And the rules of the game will keep changing. When mm. we started our business, there was practically no internet in India. So we started with the coupon booklet. Right. When internet started taking off a little bit, we thought, you know, hey, these coupons can be far better distributed to our users if we go online. Right. Uh, when world started moving further, then we saw opportunity in uh, building a products marketplace where we said that, hey, there is all this long tail of supply in India, which wants to sell products to consumers. And there's all, this, uh, all these users who want to buy different products. Mm. How can we build a technology platform to connect the two? Mm. And I think to the evolution that we are now going through. Mm. I think uh, the first time it was very hard because uh, we ourselves thought that, hey, why are we changing what we started? But then, you know, for us, what really helped us, two, three things that really helped us, one is, we were relentlessly focused on one thing beyond anything else is that you know us building a successful business a business which you know creates a large impact is mm. paramount right. everything else is secondary mm. and second thing i would say you know uh, was extreme objectivity in decision making mm. uh, i was actually reading this book a few days back uh, you know a book by andy grove called only the paranoid survive mm. it's actually very interesting mm. uh, Back in time, Intel started as a you know memory business, so they are the ones who invented memory chips, mm -hmm. and for a long time they were very successful in it. And then there came a point where uh, you know there were other market players who were far more successful than yes. Intel in the memory chip business, and Intel kept struggling because they had a new microprocessor division which mm -hmm. was doing really well but really tiny, and 80% of or 90% of the company's resources were focused on the memory business, mm -hmm. which was large but you know. No sort of declining. And there's this interesting uh, para in the book where Andy Grove and his founder, they have, they're having a chat with each other. And they really look at each other and say, hey, if our board fired both of us and got new management who we think is sharp, what do you think they'll do? And the answer to them was very obvious that they'll probably shut down the memory business and focus only on the microprocessor business. And then he said, hey, then why shouldn't we exactly. go out of this room, mm -hmm. assume that we are fired, come back and do the same thing so ourselves because if it's the fresh. right thing. Thinking so I think, uh, you know, that that uh, statement to me, uh, you know, really uh, uh, explains very well how we think as an organization because the world's changing mm. and if we are not taking the right decisions for today, right. Uh, we are doing our team, our investors, our consumers, 
our suppliers, everyone a disfavor because we are we are handed the charge of Absolutely. making the right decisions. So, uh, Rohit, the other thing is key to all this, which you say, is are th two or three things. Technology. Yeah. Um, also, you've done a lot of these things through M&A. Yeah. So it's actually a c acquisitive. Uh, Snapdeal is an acquisitive company, yeah. and uh, you know when we talk of acquisitions, then it's talking about getting outside ideation cultures mm -hmm. into your organization, mm -hmm. and thereafter, you know, moving forward with them. So how do you manage all of that at a you know balance as a balancing act? Sure. Technology always delighting the customer, staying mm -hmm. ahead, as well as getting in new ideas constantly to sort of reboot Snapdeal as sure. it were. Okay, I, I'll talk about that probably in two parts. Yeah. Uh, you know, for I'll, uh, one part is how do we use technology and how do we plan to use technology going forward, and second part is culture and you right. know uh, our acquisitions, etc. So as you rightly said, uh, you know we've been a fairly acquisitive company. Yes. Uh, we've acquired many companies in the mm. last one year. And I think one of the very interesting things for us is that since day one, uh, we started acquiring companies back in 2010, when we ourselves were a very tiny company. Right. Since 2010, not even one of the founders of the companies that we have acquired have left the organization. I think we've done somewhere between 12 and 14 mm. acquisitions. Mm. All of the guys are still here. Mm -hmm. And I was actually, you know, we were also thinking about why why do we think that is the case mm. and i think at some level i feel it has deep roots in our culture of entrepreneurship and high ownership mm. i was actually talking to one of the one of the founders who is now a vp engineering uh, at our organization and he he used to run a 25 30 people company uh, we acquired their company largely for technology talent acquisition and he's now running one of the largest chunks of our engineering portfolio and he was saying something very interesting. Uh, just we were having a coffee conversation. And he said, you know, Rohit, since the time I've come into Snapdeal, uh, even when we were running, although ours is a 1,600 people technology team and a 6,500 people company, he said, but I don't feel any different. Uh, you know, I feel the same as I used to feel when I was running a 25, 30 people startup. Mm. And he was talking to some of the other founders mm. of companies who we had acquired. Mm. And he was saying that most of them seem to feel quite at home, uh, in spite of the fact that they were running far smaller companies, which one so would expect to be far faster. Uh, you know, yeah. The DNA alive. So yeah. that to me, you know, uh, signified why yeah. why this works for us yeah. is we have a very deep uh, deep culture of high entrepreneurship yeah. and decision making. And he has said the same thing that hey, Rohit, as long as we can keep this culture alive, that Founders of small companies feel at home when they are in right, our team. Right. I think we are doing the right thing. So that to me describes why and the issue of technology. Yeah. So that's hmm. that's about you know how our culture and why we acquire companies and how how they become successful. You know about technology. Our viewpoint is very simple. Is that the whole purpose of technology uh, is to make user experience better. And I think there's always this, you know, there's a lot of talk within the organization as well as outside the organization of about big data, right. cloud platforms, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Which, by the way, we have lots of specialists on. We are one of the you know, uh, biggest users of big data in the country. Mm. But to us, the most important thing that we need to do is we need to humanize technology. Right. All these things, you know, all of, as all of us as users, they're good to hear. But all of us should also ask the question, what's in it for mm. me? And unless technology can serve the purpose of making uh, experiences far more mm. personal and far more human, that doesn't, yeah, doesn't yeah, serve. Yeah. And you know, some very interesting, for example, insights that we found out using the same big data. Uh, can anyone guess, you know, when, once people, we were doing some research on hey, when people buy something, mm. what are they most likely to buy next? And uh, can anyone guess what people buy, what are people most likely to buy after they buy helmets? The bike helmets. Sunglasses. What else? Gloves. Okay. I hear? Belt. Helmet lock. Okay. Bluetooth devices. And now, when we hear it, it sounds very obvious. Yeah. But I think these insights are hard to guess, but when we looked at our data, we saw that 
people so who were buying helmets. Within the next one week, all of them were looking for Bluetooth mm -hmm. devices because the moment you start wearing a helmet, you still right. want to talk on the phone, so you right. want a Bluetooth device. But doing these, th so I think now we are using this kind of information to make user experience far smoother, that if you bought a helmet, we'll let you know that, hey, mm -hmm. I know that yeah. most likely in seven days you you're going to, to be looking for a Bluetooth device, so we want to check it out. So using technology to get customers, closer to customers. To make every, life easier for customers. Yes. Uh, I would not be doing my job as a journalist if I didn't ask you one question which I think everybody is talking about. You just did uh, a recent you know, uh, fundraise right. and uh, you know, which has now valued you at about $7 billion. Uh, the question we keep asking and we hear around us is, is this a kind of a bubble which is you know, ticking around and waiting to burst? Or what we in Forbes India believe that there are pockets of overvaluation which is more like froth, mm -hmm. but not really a bubble. Uh, what's, what are your thoughts on that? I think it's a, it's a question I get asked very frequently these days. Yes. Uh, but you know, I think uh, our belief as an organization, and now we've been in this for, I can't call myself a veteran, but we've been doing this since 2008, nine. Mm -hmm. Uh, and as a result, have seen some cycles in the market. You know, the market crashed in 2008. Right. Market crash. There was a very bad year in 2012 as well right. uh, for startups and entrepreneur ecosystem. But I think our view as a company and as people is that uh, first of all, there are two different things: what you need to do as a business, and what's the valuation of your business. Right. I don't think the first changes fundamentally and should not change for right. a very very long time, because what you need to do has to be the right thing, has to be the right thing for your, you know, for your users, for your suppliers, for your team, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Valuation, honestly, is an outcome of all the right things that you're doing. If your valuation starts influencing what you're doing, then I don't think True. you're running the business the right way, which is why when I hear the numbers of 7 billion, it's, it's a it's number. It's an outcome. It's an outcome for us. What mm. we are really more excited about is what we are building. And valuation I've seen, is always a combination of two factors. What's the real business value in your business, which generally doesn't change much and you have to work hard for it to grow or work hard for it to degrow. Mm. And second is the market sentiment, which you know can be here or here yeah. or here. Yes. Yes. And based on that, companies can be valued in good times. Uh, companies who are not in the right business can get very valued. In bad times, even companies who are in the right business can get undervalued. Right. And as entrepreneurs, we always keep ourselves, keep reminding ourselves that we are in a very long ultra marathon, not even a marathon. Mm. And we need to keep our heads down, keep working on the right things. And all these times will keep coming and going. As long as we are the, doing the right thing for users, we are okay. So, so firmly rooted to the ground Absolutely. and customer delight. Absolutely. So we've, I'm afraid we've come completely to the end of time here for this session. We could go on and on and talk about many other things, which for a Snapdeal is doing, get some more information and news <laughs> out, of, out of you. But we'll spare you that. Thank you very much, Rohit, for doing this with us. And all the very best for Snapdeal. Thank you, Saurav. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Thanks everyone.